Okay, welcome back to Mr. Hassan's Mass Channel. This is question number six from the Solomon E collection from the old C3 papers, which is now P3. And this question is from my P3 endotopic worksheet. It's question number four from that worksheet. Um, and the topic here is functions and graphs. So it's from the endotopic worksheet two of P3, which is about functions and graphs. So this question here uh, tells us about function f, which is defined by f of x is equal to three minus x squared. And they've told us that the domain of this is all real numbers, except that x must be greater than or equal to zero. So they have limited the domain of this function to x is greater than or equal to zero. So we've got to state the range of this function f. In order to find the range of a function, it's always easier, it's always best to think about what it looks like when you sketch it. The range is all the values it can take in the, in the y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little sketch of this graph. It's a pretty simple quadratic graph here. Um, and basically, if you make a sketch of it, you'll be able to picture exactly what it looks like. Now, this is 3 minus x squared. Now, this is like a quadratic with a negative in front of the x squared. So it's going to have this kind of opening downwards type of shape, the frowny face, you could say, it has a maximum above which it never goes. And in this case, it's a pretty simple one because it's just a simple transformation of y equals x squared. It's been reflected in the x-axis and then it's been translated three units upwards. So the vertex is now at three and it goes something like this. Okay, we don't need to sketch, we don't need to write the, the coordinates of the um, x intercepts right now. All we need is um, the range, the y values. And we can see that this will never ever go above three. So the range of f of x is that f of x is less than or equal to three. Now, uh, before we go on further than that, it says x is greater than or equal to zero. So we have to also uh, take into account the fact that we don't have this part of this graph. All right, so in this case, it doesn't really make a difference to the range because that's the maximum point it reaches anyway. So when x is 0, it reaches its maximum point of 3. Okay, so that's, you can put a closed circle there, I guess. And that's how this graph looks like with this, with this restricted domain. It doesn't exist on this side, only on this side. Okay, and if you wanted to write down what this point is, which we don't actually have to in this particular part of the question, this is when y equals 0. So that means when x squared is equal to 3, so x is equal to, it would have been plus or minus root 3, but we only want the plus root 3 part because the minus root 3 part does not exist, because it only exists for x is greater than or equal to 0. So this is the function drawn of this with, with the restricted domain. And we can see that the, the range of this function is f of x is less than or equal to 3. Okay, that's the, the range of this function. Then it says sketch the graphs of y equals f of x and the inverse of f of x on the same diagram. Okay, so um, of course we've just sketch that graph. I'll just do it again. It's always good to sketch it when you have a, a question about the range. So I'm going to sketch now again. Um, so we, we figured that it starts from three and it goes down. It's like a quadratic. Let me try and make it a bit neater than that. It's like a quadratic that opens downwards and it goes like this. This is the square root of three and this is three. Okay, now the inverse function is always basically the reflection of the original function. So this is y equals f of x. It's the reflection in the line y equals x. So the x-intercept of the original function becomes the y-intercept of the, um, the, the y-intercept of the inverse function. Okay, so this is going to be root 3 and the um, y-intercept of the original function becomes the x-intercept of the inverse function, function. So it's going to look something like this. Okay, it's going to look something like this. Okay, it's going to look something like this. It won't exist on this side. Okay, when the, the, the domain of the original function is the range of the inverse. So the domain of the original function is y is equal to, greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, the domain of the inverse is going to be, um, uh, the range of the inverse is going to be y is greater than or equal to 0. 
and the uh, the range the 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 range of the in, of the in original function is y is less than or equal to three. That means the domain of the inverse function is x is less than or equal to three. So you can see that it's like a reflection in the line y equals x. Okay, the x-intercept of this. So this is now the inverse function. Okay, if I drew it in a different color, it might be more clearer. So if I change the color and made this in, in a different color, maybe that might be clear that this is the inverse function. It's not very... That's a bit better. Okay, that's the inverse function. The inverse function is going to be always the reflection of the original function in y equals x. Okay, so that's how you can draw the inverse function for this. Okay, it's a bit too thick there, but it doesn't matter. It's just a sketch. So that's the inverse function. That's the original function. And as you can see, it's like a reflection in the line y equals x. Okay, this is like the line y equals x. It's like a reflection in that line. Okay, so we have stated all the things that we need to state. Okay, we sketched the graphs. Um, we've got everything we need in this. Yeah, this can't carry on down here. Um, okay, so yeah, x-intercepts, y-intercepts, everything's there. That's all we need to sketch this graph. So that's done. And now we're going to go into part C. Now part C says, find an expression for the inverse function and state its domain. Okay, so the expression for the inverse function, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to let uh, f of x equal y. So we have y equals 3 minus x squared. And then I'm going to swap the y and the x around and then make y the subject. So I'm going to do that's y squared equals 3 minus x. So y is equal to the square root of 3 minus x. We're only concerned about the positive square root here because it's been restricted here. So we have y equals y is equal to the po positive square root of 3 minus x. Now we know that the domain of this is equal to, so the inverse function you can say is root 3 minus x. We know x is a member of all real numbers and we know that x must be uh, less than or equal to 3. Okay, we know that from the fact that the domain of the inverse function is the same as a range of the original function. Okay, we know it from there and we also know it from the fact that this can never ever be uh, negative. So if we even looked at this, we said 3 minus x must be less than or equal to 0. Okay, it must be, sorry, must be greater than or equal to 0. It can never be negative. 3 minus x must be basically greater than or equal to 0. So if you, re if you solve that inequality, it means 3 is greater than or equal to x. That means x must be less than or equal to 3. As we can see here, you know, that's something we could have, we can just state it because of the range. The range is y is less than or equal to 3 of the original function. Therefore, the domain of the inverse function is the, um, you know, is the same as the range of the original function. Now, for this question here, even if it didn't say and state its domain, you should always state the domain. Sometimes a question doesn't actually ask you to state the domain. Always state the domain in a question like this. Always. Okay, it's very important, especially when the domain of the original function was restricted like this was. Okay, because the original fun the new the inverse function is affected by the um, restriction on the original function. Now it says the function g is defined by g of x equals 8 over th uh, 3 minus x, where x is all real numbers except for 3. It says f of x equals 3 minus x squared, as we know, evaluate f of g minus 3. So what we're going to do is we're going to first find out what g minus 3 is. Now g minus 3 is 8 over 3 minus minus 3. Replace the x with minus 3, that's 8 over 6, which gives you 4 over 3. Okay, and then we got f, if you put 4 over 3 inside the function f, that's like putting g minus 3 inside the function f, because g minus 3 is 4 over 3. So f3, uh, the substituting 4 over 3 inside the function f, gives you 3 minus 4 over 3 squared, which gives you 3 minus 16 over 9, which is the same as now this is going to be um, th uh, this 9 over 9, 9 over 3, sorry, minus 16. Sorry, what am I doing? We want to make them into the same denominator. So we can make this into um, this one over 9. That's 27 over 9, sorry, minus 16 over 9, which gives you that's 11 over 9. So that is the answer to part D.
fg minus 3. So you put minus 3 in function g, see what you get, and then you substitute that in the function f. So that's 11 over 9, that's part d done. Okay, and that now we've got to go to part e. It says solve the equation inverse f equals g. So the inverse of function f, as we found before, was um, the square root of 3 minus x. So we got the square root of 3 minus x equals 8 over 3 minus x. We want to solve this equation. Now we can solve this equation in a couple of ways. One way we could do it is by um, squaring both sides. That's one way we could do it. That's one method. I'm going to use a couple of methods here just to show you. If you square both sides to get rid of the square root, this will give you 3 minus x equals 64 over 3 minus x squared. Squaring both this side. And I can notice that these two are the same. So instead of expanding all of this, what I can do is I can say, okay, this is like, if I multiply both sides by 3 minus x, I get 3 minus x to the power of 3 equals 64. Which means I take, if I take the cube root of both sides, I end up with 3 minus x equals 4. Therefore, x equals uh, 1. This is going to be x equals 3 mi minus 1, sorry. x equals minus 1. Because you end up with x equals 3 minus 4, which is minus 1. So x equals minus 1. Okay, that's um, the, s the solution to this. Okay, x equals minus 1. Um, let's have a look here. The square root of that equals 8 over 3 minus x. Okay, that's one, one, one way we can deal with that. Another way we could deal with this is multiplying both sides by 3 minus x in the beginning. Now remember, this is like 3 minus x to the power of a half equals 8 over 3 minus x. If you multiply by 3 minus x, this is like to the power of 1. So you have to multiply these two, you add the powers. So it's 3 minus x to the power of 3 over 2 equals 8. And then we can take the, uh, we can basically raise both sides to the power of 2 thirds. So you have 3 minus x is equal to 8 to the power of 2 thirds. If you raise the power of this of 2 thirds, okay, you got to raise this power, this to the power of 2 thirds. So 3 minus x is equal to, now that's like um, the cube root of 8, which is 2. 2 squared is 4. So you end up with, therefore, x is equal to, as we said, um, minus 1. Okay, so there's two different ways of getting the same answer. Now, over here, because the inverse function, remember the inverse function f of x was equal to the square root of 3 minus x, and its domain was x is less than or equal to 3. That was the domain of the inverse function. And g of x is all real numbers. So x is less than or equal to 3. This, this solution is fine for that because you know x equals minus 1 is within the domain of the inverse function and the original function. They will both, you know, they will definitely intersect in that region because the inverse function, remember, it looks something like this. And g of x, 8 over 3 minus x is going to have, it's going to look like something like this. Okay, so they're going to intersect at minus 1 as we saw here. Okay, so one of them looks like this and the other one looks like this. It's like uh, 1 over x. It's like a transformation of 1 over x um, except x can't be 3. So there's going to be an asymptote at 3. So it's going to be something like this. Asymptote at 3 and it's going to um, have another asymptote like this. So it's going to... Let me just draw it properly just to show you. You don't need to draw it but just to show you that Basically, one of the graphs, the graph of the inverse function, okay, looks something like this. That's where x equals 3. Okay, it's, that's how it looks. It goes to root 3 over here. The other function, x can't be 3, so this is, this is an asymptote for x here. Okay, and we know that um, when x is 0, y is 8 over 3. So it's going to go like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go something like this. And on this side is going to be on this side here. It's, it's like the reflection of 1 over x. 1 over x would be in these two parts. But this is a minus 1 over x. So it's going to be in these two parts. And the, the, the horizontal asymptote, the vertical asymptote, sorry, is going to move from 0 to 3. So it's going to, of course, have an intersection somewhere there. Okay, so that's what we've just found, where x is minus 1, where they intersect. Just to be able to picture what we've done here. All right, so that's absolutely fine. So now that's the... Um, the last part of this question. So this question is now done. Um, other questions you might want to watch from the Solomon E collection from P3 can be found in this.
playlist as I answer them. Other questions that you um, might want to watch from the end of topic worksheet of uh, P3 for you know, what I give my students can be found in the playlist over here. Other questions which are in general from functions and graphs of P3 you can find the collection of those in this playlist. You can subscribe to my channel by clicking on this link over here. Thank you for watching and see you soon.